so welcome to lecture number 33 for our thin film uh, technology course uh, and this section uh, uh, we will discuss about uh, the growth methods including a CVD or a vapor phase epitaxy as a common deposition methods for thin film and IC fabrications. Uh, I am Dr. Furvez Amar. So let's start uh, today's lectures uh, with the growth methods. So, uh, you know that there are been common methods for uh, the growth of the uh, epitaxy. Uh, that is, uh, we have a wafer, a wafer phase epitaxy uh, that we shortly denote by uh, VPE or a formal uh, or a form of the CVD. I mean, uh, wafer phase epitaxy, we say that it's a form of a chemical wiper deposition technique. So what happened in these techniques uh, or what is the formal definition of these techniques or formal introduction of this technique. So what happened uh, in wafer phase epitaxy technique so our, uh, in CVD techniques. So just like we have uh, I mean some uh, previous definition. So we will try to a bit differentiate the wafer phase epitaxy then from uh, uh, the, the journal CVD. So what actually we have in wafer phase epitaxy we have a transport of Fe layer constituents uh, which normally uh, silicons, uh, galliums, uh, ars uh, arsenics and other dolphin. I mean these are the constituent materials. Uh, so we have the transport of Fe layer constituent. Uh, what are the constituents? So uh, these are the constituents uh, that already we described and uh, in the form of one or more uh, volatile compounds to the substrates. Uh, where they react to form the Fe layers. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, somehow uh, we can say that a formal uh, definition for wafer phase uh, uh, epitaxy, that is uh, what we have in uh, wafer phase epitaxy. We have the transport, uh, transport of the Fe layer constituents and the form of one or more volatile compounds to the substrates uh, where they react to form uh, the Fe layers. Then we have another growth methods uh, that we call molecular beam epitaxy, uh, the detail of which we will uh, discuss in the coming lectures. I mean, this should be the last lecture. Uh, so what happened in molecular beam epitaxy? Uh, so in this technique, uh, we have uh, some sort of the physical transport of materials uh, to a heated substrate uh, through uh, vacuum evaporations. Uh, so what it mean? It means that a molecular beam epitaxy uh, is a kind of the techniques uh, in which uh, uh, we have the physical transports of the materials to a heated substrate uh, through vacuum evaporations. Uh, then we have another technique that we call uh, liquid phase epitaxy or in short we can write it LPE. Uh, so what is this? Uh, it is again is a kind of the technique in which the growth of epitaxial layers on the crystalline substrate, uh, I mean uh, uh, the crystalline substrate, it happens by direct precipitations from the liquid phase. Let me explain again uh, what is liquid uh, phase epitaxy. So again it is uh, a technique for Fe layer depositions. Uh, so what we have in these techniques, so in this technique the growth of a epitaxial layer on the crystalline substrate occur by direct uh, precip uh, precipitations from the liquid phase. I mean we have uh, the, the, the diffusions, uh, I mean uh, by direct precipitation from the liquid phase on a crystalline uh, substrate. So the, uh, what kind of substrate we can utilize, we can uh, utilize silicon substrate, we can utilize, uh, I mean whatever the substrate we're trying to utilize in liquid phase epitaxy, uh, we should remember only one thing that is the substrate should be uh, a crystalline substrate, I mean it should be the, uh, the amorphous uh, substrate. So let's first come toward the silicon vapor phase epitaxy. Uh, uh, in silicon's vapor phase epitaxy, uh, we can utilize all of these, uh, these are the compound, the silicon based compound, this uh, first, second, third and fourth one. These are most, uh, these are the most commonly utilized uh, uh, silicon based compounds that have been used for uh, vapor phase epitaxy growth, I mean for the silicon. Uh, 
that is an silicon VPE uh, uh, these are the compound that that are uh, that they are being and used uh, are being and more generally used for uh, the growth of uh, vapor phase of taxi of the uh, silicon so in all these compound uh, that we have just listed uh, here in all these listed compound silicon tetrachloride that is this one the first one that we call silicon tetrachloride is the most is the most studies as and the uh, and has the widest industrial use i mean this one the silicon tetrachloride uh, is the most studied and has the widest uh, industrial uh, use uh, the other silicon sources uh, that is uh, uh, these three compounds uh, they are, they are also uh, they also can be utilized as sources of the silicons uh, they are also used uh, because of lower reaction temperature i mean these compound uh, they, they, they can also be utilized as a silicon sources uh, and the reason behind uh, their utilization or their uses is uh, their lower reactions uh, temperature so the chemical reactions uh, that we can uh, i mean uh, that's happen normally when we are trying to get uh, uh, silicon vpe uh, so uh, this is uh, the more formal chemical reactions that happen and we have a silicon tetrachloride uh, in the gaseous space so we run the reactions uh, in the hydrogen environment uh, so as a result of that reactions i mean uh, the reaction is being performed at 1200 degrees centigrade so when the reaction is performed we have silicons uh, uh, in the solid form and along with that we have hcl uh, in the gaseous form so an in, in, in additional uh, computing reaction is taking place uh, that we can write it here. Again, uh, we have uh, the silicon tetrachloride in gaseous form. Uh, and along with that, uh, we just have uh, uh, the silicon in the solid. So the two-way reactions, so that is we can, we can match silicon dichloride in the gaseous form. I mean, so it's a two-way reaction. I mean, we can perform it. In either direction similarly the above reaction is always a two-way reactions uh, so we can run in both directions so if the silicon tetrachloride concentration is too high uh, so etching rather than the growth of silicon will take place i mean this is the thing we should uh, keep in mind that whenever we're trying to run the reactions uh, so we should remember that the, uh, we should remember or we should note the uh, the concentration of the silicon tetrachloride and why we should do that because if the concentrations of the silicon tetrachloride is too high uh, then uh, we will have uh, etching instead of the growth of the silicons uh, i mean uh, uh, if, if we are really expecting the growth of the silicon so we should have to focus on the concentration of the silicon tetrachloride and we should not make it too high because if we make it too high the concentrations so then we will have uh, etching instead of the growth of the uh, silicon so that we should properly uh, care about so if the carrier gas entering the reactors uh, contain hydrochloric acids uh, etching will take place again i mean etching is not only because of the higher concentrations of silicon tetrachloride but etching can also take place if we have the carrier gas uh, that's entering the reactors contain hydrochloric acid i mean if we have this carrier gas i mean normally we utilize hydrogen as a carrier gas but if we have the carrier gas uh, and that this contains hydrochloric acid i mean it's, uh, if by some defaults or maybe uh, uh, let's suppose we run the reaction in such a way that by uh, the, the reaction of these two it's results in hydrochloric acid so if we have uh, the carrier gas that is uh, and somehow maybe by 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 some mistake uh, we get uh, hydrochloric acid in the uh, the carrier gas so again we will have the etching problem uh, that will occur instead of the uh, growth of the silicon so this etching is used for in situ cleaning of the silicon vapors prior to epitaxial growth i mean uh, you should not know this point again. I mean, uh, we're saying that it is not always that bad uh, uh, that one may think of. I mean, here we say that uh, too much concentrations uh, of silicon tetrachloride reserves and the etching 
of the silicon. Similarly, we, we are saying that if we have HCl uh, in a carrier gas, so it will also result in the uh, etching of the silicon. So, uh, is etching is uh, that much bad? Uh, not at all. I mean, we can have uh, some goods from the etching, and that is uh, this etching is used for in situ cleaning of the silicon vapors prior to uh, epitaxial growth. I mean, prior to epitaxial growth, we can do the cleanings, uh, the in situ cleaning of the silicon vapor uh, before uh, the epitaxial uh, growth. I mean, we can utilize the etching techniques. Uh, for the in situ cleaning of the uh, silicon vapor, so uh, the, the the etching is not too bad, uh, and we can utilize the etchings. Uh, you know, even in severity technique, we can utilize the etching uh, for so many. Uh, I mean, applications. Uh, the halide process for gallium arsenide uh, diffusions. Uh, so, what happened in these techniques? Uh, you can see here. So, um, I mean, this is the reaction chambers. And these are the gases, uh, arsala, uh, arsenic, tetrachloride, and uh, the carrier gas hydrogens. And uh, what's the things, uh, I mean, so how the things happen inside the chambers. So uh, this is being explained here. Uh, and this process, uh, we have transfers of the uh, gallium. Uh, we have transport of the galliums accomplished by means of the halide. And the halide is uh, arsenic tetrachloride. Uh, here you can see it here, arsenic tetrachloride is being uh, found here, and here we have the gallium source, and uh, which is being capped at a temperature from 800 to 850 degrees centigrade. So what we have next, uh, both the hydrogens, uh, both the hydrogen and arsenic tetrachloride vapors enter the systems and they react. I mean here you can see that both of these materials, that is uh, SCL3. And uh, H2 hydrogen molecules, they are entering, uh, entering the systems and they react. So what does the reaction look like? I mean, here's the reactions. I mean, that is how uh, arsenic uh, tetrachloride gas reacts with the hydrogen gas. And as a result, uh, we get again the arsenic in a gaseous form. Along with that, we get uh, hydrochloric acid in the gaseous form. So this reaction product flows over the gallium uh, that you can see it here. Uh, we have this reaction product. I mean, first of all, these two gases they react and they form uh, these two gases. So this reaction product flows over the gallium source uh, that we have here. This is the gallium source. So what happened? And gallium arsenide form as a crust on the surface of gallium. I mean, uh, when this reaction product uh, when this reaction product it flows over the gallium source we have this gallium source so as a result of that flow it results in the formation of gallium arsenide uh, gallium arsenide uh, as a crust on the surface of the gallium i mean here uh, it's being formed as a crust on the substrate of the uh, sorry on the surface of the gallium and the reactions uh, it can look like here that is we have galliums uh, and that it's arsenic uh, when it flows over. So as a result, we get uh, gallium arsenide uh, crust on the surface of the uh, gallium. So what happened with the HCl? Uh, the HCl gas resulting from the first reactions uh, transfer gallium to the substrate in the form of gallium chloride, whereas uh, uh, where the gallium arsenide is deposited at 750 uh, degrees centigrade. I mean, here you can see that in this particular reaction, we have arsenic and we have uh, uh, hydrochloric acid as the reaction product. So here, uh, both of these, they have the functions to perform. I mean, the arsenic reacts with the gallium source and it forms gallium arsenide and uh, by following these reactions, whereas the HCl that resulted from these reactions, uh, what happened with this? Uh, the HCl gas resulting from the first reactions uh, that is here uh, transport gallium to the substrate. I mean, uh, this is the gallium, and this is transferred to the substrate. This is the substrate. I mean, you can see it here. This is the substrate. 
and the galliums from here is being transferred by the HCl uh, to this, uh, this substrate in the form of gallium chloride. Gallium is transferred to this substrate by the HCl in the form of gallium chloride, uh, whereas the gallium arsenide is deposited at 750 degrees centigrade. Here we say that uh, the gallium arsenide, uh, first uh, gallium is carried to the substrate in the form of gallium chloride, uh, where the gallium arsenide is deposited at 750 degrees centigrade here in this particular. Uh, I mean, at this substrate here we have, this is the substrate uh, temperature that is 700, uh, 750 degrees centigrade, while uh, at 900 degrees centigrade we have uh, the etching of the substrate. And this is the reactions uh, that's happened. We have gallium arsenide uh, uh, plus HCl, and the reaction is being performed. Uh, if the temperature is greater than uh, 800 degrees centigrade, uh, so we have uh, gallium chloride along with that hydrogen and arsenic. But if we say that if we reduce uh, the temperature that is smaller than uh, smaller than 800 degrees centigrade, uh, so we get what we get gallium arsenide and along with that uh, HCl in the gaseous form. So that's why we are saying that uh, gallium arsenide uh, gallium arsenide is being deposited at the substrate. Uh, at a temperature that's equal to 750 degrees centigrade it's because of this reason. If we increase the temperature, so an increased temperature will result in uh, gallium chloride. So we won't be able to deposit a gallium arsenide film if the temperature is greater than uh, 800 degrees centigrade. So that's why here at 900 degrees centigrade, we're saying that the etching happened. I mean, at temperatures higher than 750, that is almost equal to 90 degrees centigrade, uh, 900 uh, degrees centigrade. So we have at these temperatures, uh, we have the etching. So as a result of etching, we get gallium chloride, hydrogen, and arsenic. The uh, hydride process for gallium arsenide uh, diffusions. So uh, fluxes of galliums and arsenic species form independently that lead to greater controls in the vapor phase and has a wide controls of the diffusions uh, parameter. I mean, this is, this is somehow uh, a further explanations of the hydride process for gallium arsenide uh, depositions. So uh, what is that? I mean, so first of all, we have fluxes, uh, we have fluxes of gallium and arsenic species. I mean, we have the explanation of the previous slide. I mean here uh, you can see it, uh, this is gallium and this is uh, uh, arsenic. So uh, the thing that we are explaining on the next slide uh, is that uh, we have fluxes of gallium and arsenic species uh, that's been formed independently. I mean we have reactions in which we independently get or independently form uh, gallium and arsenic. So what happened? That lead to greater control in the vapor phase and has a wider wider controls of the diffusions uh, parameters. AS4 for arsenic and gallium chloride for uh, gallium components are used. I mean for the arsenic we use AS4 and uh, gallium chloride for uh, gallium components they are being used and the reaction just like you can see it here. This is gallium chloride and this is AS4 or gas uh, in the hydrogen environment that lead to gallium arsenide and the solid and uh, the solid form that is in the form of Fe layer. And along with that, we have the HCl gas. So AS4 is generated by thermal decomposition of arsine. I mean, uh, this might be a question that from where we can get AS4. So AS4 is basically generated by thermal decompositions of uh, arsine, that is ASH3. Uh, we have the following reactions, and this is the reactions that uh, we have arsine. Uh, and the arsine is being decomposed, uh, decomposed at a higher temperature that lead to S4, along with that, the hydrogens. So gallium chloride is generated by the reactions uh, that already we discussed. 
that is uh, we have the reactions uh, two way reactions as reaction between gallium and uh, the hydrochloric acid so HCl so two way reactions again we have gallium chloride and here we have mentioned that that is uh, when we have the HCl is passing through so it's carrying the gallium from uh, the gallium source uh, to the substrate in the form of the gallium chloride and so this is the reaction that high form now he's saying that it's happening at higher temperatures but if you reduce the temperature uh, so it's been deposited in the form of thin film of gallium uh, arsenide the argonometallic process so what is mean by uh, MOCVD MOCVD stand for uh, metal organic uh, metal organic uh, CVD uh, or that we can write OMVFE uh, which mean that uh, ar ar uh, organo metallic uh, wafer phase uh, epitaxy uh, so what we have in this technique just like you can see it here uh, this is uh, the process or the experimental setup the picture that uh, that, that you see here is not uh, is mainly taken from the Wikipedia. So here you can see the link. If you are interested, you can take this. Uh, I mean, you can easily go to Wikipedia for the search and full details of this experimental setup uh, that's been utilized for argonometallic process. This is, uh, I mean, OMVP, argonometallic wafer phase epitaxy. So what happened in this setup? Uh, we have halide and hydride process. So halide and hydride process cannot be extended to the growth of aluminium gallium arsenide by the simultaneous growth of gallium arsenide and aluminium arsenide. Because growth of aluminium arsenide occur at approximately 1100 degrees centigrade. Let me repeat it again. Halide and hydride process cannot be extended to the growth of aluminium gallium arsenides by the simultaneous growth of gallium arsenide and aluminium or aluminium arsenide. Why? Because the growth of aluminium arsenides occur uh, is almost 1100 degrees centigrade. So this problem, uh, uh, this problem is avoided in the argonometallic process. So what happened in the argonometallic process? Uh, we have many materials uh, that we wish to deposit. Uh, have a very low vapor pressures and thus are uh, difficult to transport via the gases. Again, let me repeat uh, many gases that we wish to deposit have very low vapor pressures and thus are difficult to transport uh, via the gases. So, one solution uh, is to chemically attach the metals that is, gallium, aluminium, copper, etc., to an organic. Uh, compounds that has a very high vapor pressures. I mean, uh, we have a problem, uh, and the problem is that uh, there we have many materials that we wish to deposit, uh, but they have very low vapor pressures, and it's because of that low vapor pressures they are very difficult to try to be transported via the gases. So this is the problem due to vapor pressures. Uh, I mean, we are due to the low vapor pressures, we are unable to transport the materials that we uh, that we wish to deposit. Uh, we are the gases uh, transport. I mean, this is the problem. So in order to solve these problems, uh, we get a solutions. We get one solutions, and that particular solution is to chemically attach the metals that, for example, gallium, aluminium, copper, etc to an organic compounds that have a very high vapor pressures. I mean, instead of utilizing the gases as a transport, uh, we utilize an organic compound uh, which has a very high vapor pressure. So what happened with this? Uh, the organic metal bond is uh, very weak and can be broken via thermal means on the vapors, uh, depositing the metal with the high vapor pressure uh, uh, organics uh, being pumped away. So this is the process. I mean, one might have the questions. If we use the organic compounds instead of the transport gases, so what will happen to the uh, to the organic compounds once we deposited uh, uh, once we deposited the the material that we are, that we wish to deposit in the palm of thin film? So th this this questions can easily be answered. That uh, we should know the fact that organic metal bond is very weak. 
and can be broken via thermal means on the wafers. I mean, this is the most easiest way due to weaker bonds. Uh, the organic ma uh, the organic matter can easily be broken uh, by thermal means uh, even on the vapors. So uh, depositing the matter with high vapor pressures, organics uh, are being formed for wear. So I mean uh, the, the the metals, uh, the organic matter can easily be pumped away from the uh, process, and we will have the fewer film uh, that might be deposited by the uh, organometallic uh, process. So some organometallic uh, chemical vapor deposition precursor gases uh, they are being most frequently in used are uh, tri uh, methyl aluminiums uh, that normally comes in the liquid form. Uh, we have uh, trimethyl galliums, uh, it's normally again come in the liquid. We have arsine, and arsine is mostly come in the gaseous form. Uh, we have dimethyl uh, selenide, uh, again, this is in the liquid phase, a liquid form. Uh, dimethyl zinc, uh, and it's again come in the uh, liquid, uh, liquid form. So, these are some of the, the precursors they are uh, most frequently utilized. Uh, in metal or, uh, metal organic uh, chemical vapor deposition techniques the the experimental setup uh, that uh, we utilize for organic metallic process can be uh, just like the one you can see it here i mean it's the uh, the experimental setup i mean you can make it even in your own lab if you have the logic are uh, according to your own needs that is what particular compounds uh, I mean you want to deposit so here you can see that uh, I mean again uh, this is uh, I mean uh, uh, the chamber the quartz reactors uh, inside this quartz reactors here you can see that we put the vapors on which we want to deposit the film and the heating is normally performed via the RF uh, power it's radio frequency uh, we have radio frequency coil around the chamber so RF power uh, is being utilized for the heating purpose and here you see that uh, there are beans bar we have the susceptors here these are the group I susceptors and uh, you know the last time we mentioned that the susceptor has been protected by a thin layer of some particular materials so one side of this goes to the vacuum where we utilize a vacuum pump to evacuate the systems uh, and this is toward uh, the exhaust and here uh, we have the arrangement for the different gases I mean you can see it here uh, we have purified hydrogens that have been utilized as an uh, environment uh, there's a reactions atmosphere or the, as a carrier gas so here's I mean uh, uh, we have different wall system uh, it's something like a very complex particularly for the people who are new in the course uh, are here who are new researchers are trying to enter the course so it's a bit complex but once you become an expert so you can easily understand this kind of process and uh, maybe it's uh, it's almost exists this kind of structures uh, this kind of experimental setup is it exists almost in every lab particularly for uh, I mean it's for uh, uh, the people who's working on the in the field of uh, graphene or carbon nanotubes they have wanted some special arrangement of the CVD at their lab. So here, these are the arrangement for the different gases flow. I mean, so we utilize the precursor in the form of the uh, different gases are the in the liquid form. So what happens? Uh, I mean, what are the advantages of these techniques? So be remembered, uh, this technique, uh, this technique has, uh, uh, this has highly. Uh, it has a high flexibility I mean it's highly flexible techniques and we can deposit uh, semiconductors metal and dielectric via this technique the disadvantages or some of the main disadvantages or demerit of this technique include uh, highly toxic precursors uh, and be remembers so very expensive source materials and environmental disposal costs are high so these are are some of the drawback uh, some of the drawback uh, of this particular technique that we call organo uh, organometallic process so organometallic process i mean the main drawback is highly toxic gases uh, the gases that we utilize is highly toxic uh, and the sources that we utilize is also very expensive uh, materials 
and uh, environmental disposal costs are also very high. So, uh, material that we can deposit, uh, so it's the last of the materials uh, that is uh, we can deposit what we can deposit 3 pop semiconductor. Uh, these are basically, uh, this is basically the last of 3 pop semiconductors uh, materials. Uh, so, I'm just only giving the name of the compounds uh, that is 3 pop semiconductors. Similarly, we can deposit. Uh, Two five, uh, two four, uh, semi, sorry, two sex semiconductors. I mean, the main uh, two sex semiconductors uh, include all these uh, uh, semiconductor in the compound form. Similarly, where this we can uh, deposit a group four semiconductor, which is mainly silicon, germanium, and a strand silicon. So these are all the materials. Uh, that we can deposit by utilizing the organometallic uh, process. So that's all we have for this lecture. Thanks for watching. See you uh, in the last lecture for this course. Uh, till then, bye bye.